It doesn't matter what part of the industry that you want to get into when it comes to TIG welding. If you want to walk the cup on heavy wall pipe, maybe you want to freehand. Maybe you want to do some performance racing on exhausts or sanitary welding. You want to work on a bench. You want to weld artwork. It does not matter if it's stainless, carbon, aluminum. I can tell you five easy steps right now that can drastically improve your TIG welding. On today's episode, what you're going to end up seeing is simple adjustments, simple techniques that you can change with your body, with your equipment, along with some good arc shots, some bad arc shots, some good looking welds, some bad looking welds. And in my eight years of welding education, I've seen every beginner struggle with these things while every professional doesn't even have to think about it when they strike the arc. Starting first off with having to use more than one hand, sometimes even a foot. Whether it's your first time picking up a TIG torch or you've been doing it for a little bit, you understand that switching from stick welding and MIG welding like this to having a filler metal to shove in your puddle feels a little bit uncomfortable. There's no other better advice I can give but to practice. I'll go ahead and tell you first off, take your glove off, put that wire in between your thumb and your index finger, and then pinch it with your index finger and middle finger, and practice that technique with your bare hand. Once you get used to it, invest in some TIG gloves. Most of the students that I've seen in my eight years will start with some big thick gloves. They went from stick welding or MIG welding, they have these chunky gloves, and you just can't feel that wire really well. Go down, if you're gonna practice, take your glove off. Dry runs are very important, and that's simply just figuring out where you need to start to where you need to finish and making sure you're comfortable all the way through. A lot of people don't understand that you really need to plan for where you're going and not for where you start. If you get really comfortable at the beginning of a weld, you're gonna find out after just a few seconds that you're uncomfortable again. Where if you can get your hand in the middle of your weld or towards the end of where you think you're gonna stop and reach to where you wanna weld, you might be uncomfortable at this point, but as you weld, you're only gonna get closer to being comfortable. Practicing these dry runs, whether you're pipe welding, starting at the bottom, going towards the top, or maybe you're TIG welding on a bench, we wanna make sure that we're able to feed in that wire. The other thing that can be a variable is a remote. We don't wanna just stomp on our foot pedal and give all of our amperage right away. We wanna ease in, make your weld, have a nice upslope, make it all the way across. When you're ready to stop, just back off that foot pedal. If that's too much for you to think about, don't worry about it. Take the foot pedal off, take the remote off. A lot of those machines will have a lift arc feature where you can just do it with a lift arc setting. We want to get comfortable and the only way to do that is by practicing. Dry runs are easy. You can do this at home. You can take your TIG rig off your hose and just practice, practice, practice. But we want to make sure we're practicing properly and we have our head in the same place too because you can't weld what we can't see. And that's what brings me to my next point is head placement. The next tip I'm going to give you is probably one of my favorites. It's the easiest thing that you can do and it's like an aha moment I've had with so many different students. And it's simply just head placement. But before I teach them where to put their head, I look at their hood. Because you can't weld what you can't see, and if you've got a bad clear lens, you can't see. Even if you can see, you really can't until you put a new one in, and then you're like, holy moly, it is a new world in here. I love having a new clear lens. Try to change them out as often as possible. If the company man is providing lenses, I change them out freaking daily. Let's just start by saying if you got your head back here, you're in the bad place. You don't know what you're doing. You can't see what you're doing. Maybe you were in a good spot and then as you welded, your head fell behind the torch. Pipe welding is the same way. Never let your head get behind your torch. Where your head goes, your body follows, right? So if we can get our head in front, then our body follows everything. And again, with our dry run techniques, we want that. We wanna be able to have our head move with our torch. So keeping that in mind, our head needs to stay in front of it. Now, I've seen a lot of students stay pretty much right on top of it. Doesn't mean that you can't get away with this, but what I've noticed is if you're standing right in front of your torch, it's okay, you can kind of weld, but you're not seeing that little bit of arc length deviation that makes a good weld versus a perfect weld. And typically when a lot of students, they get started, a lot of people get started, they're welding like this right on top of the torch and they're forcing, they can't see real good, so they're pulling their arc length away or walking the cup, they're leaning that torch a little bit back so they can see better. And that ends up making that wire not as stable, not getting the kind of puddle that you're looking for. It just doesn't keep everything uniform. If you can see that little deviation in arc length, you'll be able to a lot better if you move your head way over here. That may have looked drastic, but I'm talking about get eye level with that bad boy when you're starting out with and make sure your head is at the end of it. Now you can see my head's not moving because I'm always gonna be in front of my torch on a small weld like this. Now when it comes to pipe welding and welding make much longer welds, try to get in a habit of moving with your torch. Again, always staying in front of it. 
I think it's funny whenever I see students slip off the pipe when they're trying to learn how to walk the cup, they'll slip. And it's because they were walking, they're walking, they're walking, but their body hasn't moved and then they slip off of it. So keep that in mind that head placement is crucial. It changes your arc length drastically, which brings me to my next trick is just keeping a puddle on the plate or even getting one on there in the first place and not putting this guy in too quickly. And I do understand that talking about it and being about it are two different things because I could talk to a group of students till I was blue in the face about being comfortable, getting their dry runs down, changing their clear lenses, keeping their head in front of the puddle, doesn't matter. Sometimes they still make those mistakes when they get in there because they're not seeing the puddle properly or they're not even making one. So if you've got these big, chunky, hunky welds, the first thing I'm looking at is your amperage and your arc length. When your arc length is way up too high, you're not putting a puddle on that plate. It's like a big cone, a flame that comes off the end of a TIG rig. And we wanna push that flame into the puddle. If you're seeing that flame, whether you're leaning back or you're too far up, you need to lean down or get closer. We gotta get that arc length manageable. And you'll notice again, if you're not comfortable and didn't plan for where you were going, you might end up having your arc length start to increase as you weld because you can't see what you're doing. So practice that. Ditch the filler metal and just weld with the torch, but don't grab it with this other hand. You have to keep this other hand away because we have to play pretend that we're gonna always have that filler metal in our hand. So practice with your torch like this, doing nothing but autogenous TIG welding, which is a weld without filler metal, and make sure that you can establish a puddle and hold the puddle all the way across. Once you've done that a few times and you realize what that looks like, then start adding that filler metal in. This filler is your chiller. So when you get a puddle and you push it in, you'll realize as soon as you start adding that filler metal that the puddle's gonna slow down. So maybe you adjust your amperage or whatever you need to do. What I see a lot of other students doing too is when, they, when you tell them to add some wire, boy, do they add some wire. And now they don't even have enough puddle for the wire they're putting in. So you get these little string bean welds as you start welding too quickly or without a good enough puddle. Uh, and they might look pretty and all, but they're not worth a dang because you didn't melt and properly fuse anything because you started off welding way too quickly. So when you get a puddle and you push it in, you need to slow down because this needs to break down just as much as that base metal needs to melt too. And then you also need to have the right size filler metal to weld with, with the metal you're welding on. So I did a little bit of a, an experiment to show you guys kind of what that will look like, right? So we take the first weld, we welded with no filler metal, going back on trying to get comfortable and doing dry runs and practicing without filler, this is a good thing to try out. Just trying to hold the size of a puddle you're looking for and making it all the way across. The next wire we add is what I like to call spaghetti wire, and that's 045 diameter. This wire is so much thinner than this eighth inch base metal that I have that it just melts right into the puddle. Super easy, we get really consistent ripples, really nice, smooth, and flat. Then we move up into the 16th inch wire. Now the 16th inch wire is still a chiller, so we're gonna end up having to slow down a little bit more so we may not get as shiny of a color and you'll notice that the toes aren't as wetted in. It starts to get a little bit lumpier around the sides, okay? Now we start getting into the weeds when we add a 332nd size TIG wire. We're having a whole lot of issues trying to wet in a good clean puddle. It's chunky, it's lumpy, it's slow. You might could turn up your amperages, but for a metal that's only an eighth inch thick, we don't necessarily need that. So don't use it. <laughs> We're using eighth, the same size filler metal. I don't think I need to explain it. It just gets worse and worse and worse. If we get thicker with it, you're gonna get a chunky, lump, lumpy weld. Again, you can flatten that out with a bunch of beans. Beans equals amps. If you wanna turn things up, you can. If you can't, if you're in a smaller shop or you're running off 110, you can't melt this because you're only running at 65 amps. I guarantee you can melt this spaghetti wire. Use the right wire for the base metal you're working with. It's super crucial. It's an easy thing to, to understand. Do it that way. Yes, you can get carried away when it comes to all the consumables that come with a TIG torch. We've got your standard size gas lenses, your mini gas lenses, your collet body setups, all different sizes for those. We've got your jumbo gas lenses here. We've got all your cups that fits those. We've got these fancier ceramic cups. We've got more lenses and screens. We've got different shapes and sizes of TIG torches with valves and whatnots. But what I'm here to tell you is most of the machines, when you buy them, where did it go? Oh, they come with this old guy right here. Your typical collet body setup. This right here, you can weld a lot of stuff with, especially in carbon steel, right? You're welding nothing but carbon steel. 
You can get away with it doing open roots. You can get away with it doing pipe. Uh, you can do it on plate. I mean, it doesn't, these, this will weld. This will weld all day. Switching to a different cup size, getting new rigs, getting whatever is not gonna make you a better welder. You can be a good welder with just this right here. However, I believe that switching over to a gas lens setup is gonna typically be better for you, especially when you're welding outside of carbon steel. Now, moving to stainless and titaniums, the more argon you'll need. So that's why a bigger gas lens is nicer. You'll even see that as you weld with a collet body style, you'll be able to make a weld, but you'll see at the end of the arc, it's a little flutterier. It's got a little bit of a unstable arc, if you will. And that's just the gas being just so concentrated and not, diffused as well as say when I switch over to this crazy 15 cup with a bunch of screens that help diffuse it and make the same weld, you'll see that there is a, a color difference and a quality difference. On stainless steel, it's a little tricky, but guys, don't get carried away. Don't break the bank when it comes to trying to set up your TIG rig for success because this is not what makes a good welder. It's practice that makes a good welder. If you can afford to get into a bunch of different crazy stuff and whatever, it's your money. Right, but you don't need it. Your equipment's not what's gonna make or break you. It's just the knowledge, right? And if you need more knowledge, somebody's gotta teach it to you, whether it be me or through our friends at the American Welding Program. They have a ton of great resources when it comes to the theory. We could teach you the hands-on all you want right here, but if you wanna learn the why, head over to the American Welding Program. We've got tons of courses in there for you to take, sign up for, get micro-credentials, and build out a resume, and that's gonna help you in life. Trust me, it's helped me a lot understanding the reason why, and if I had something like the American American welding program when I came up, I think I could do it a little bit quicker this time. Anyway, if you want a clean, shiny weld, you need to have clean, shiny metal and clean, shiny tungsten, point blank, period. Not just a wire wheel. You can see the difference in this weld here that I just buffed with a wire wheel and then made the weld, even while kind of dragging the tip of my tungsten into the puddle a little bit compared to, say, this weld where I kept a proper arc length and everything and the material was clean all the way down to that base metal and it's nice and shiny. I know dipping tungsten is very frustrating. If you start seeing these little chunks or little splits at the tip of your tungsten or that tip's no longer there because you got a ball on it or you straight up got a whole chunk of filler metal stuck to the tip of your tungsten, you need a new one. You need to clean it, you need to prep it, you need to grind it. My preference is with this grinder, I'll spin it across, make sure it grinds off all that contamination and then I move that grinder to the end so that I can get all my grinding marks to the tip because I know that y'all are gonna trip if I don't do that. For me, I know that it's frustrating having to dip and then go back to the grinder, dip, go back to the grinder. So take a 10 pack of tungsten, break them in half. I know that's controversial. And then what you're gonna end up doing is sharpening both ends. You'll take a 10 pack of tungsten, make it a 40 pack of tungsten super quick, and you'll have tungsten for all freaking day. And that's gonna save you a ton of time and a ton of frustration, keeping a bunch of sharp tungsten on you and keeping your metal clean. To all the pros watching, let me know down in the comments if this is some of the advice that you would recommend any newbie have. If you're a newbie watching, let me know down in the comments what other stuff you wanna learn. I appreciate everyone who watches. We'll see you on the next well.